Hello, my name is Ibrahim Mustafa, and uh, today we are here with you to bring you another edition of the Change Makers program, where we get to celebrate and uh, learn from people who've created change, young people across the globe. And today we are going to talk to an industrious woman. She's an Indian British business executive. She's a filmmaker and TV producer. She has a 20 year career as film and TV producer with BBC Television, Carlton Television and Channel 4, as well as CEO of her, her independent production company, Formation Films. She was the executive, uh, chief executive officer for the Elmelu Foundation. And today we get to hear from our own mother, auntie and sister. Thank you for being part of this and uh, thank you for that incredible profile. And thank you for that incredible introduction. Right. You know, when, you, when you hear yourself reflected back, you think, oh my God, I am so old and I should stop <laughs> working now or stop. Yes, no, but thank you so much. Wow, wow. Wow, well, great, great, great. So uh, that was, the introduction was before COVID-19. And yeah. uh, I'd like to know who you are uh, <laughs> in the midst of COVID-19 and after COVID-19, who you are going to be? That's a very, very good question. I guess it's a question that every, each and every one of us across the globe, and that's the, the amazing thing about this virus, is, you know, how that my, you know, what you feel, whether you're sitting in Ghana or as I am sitting in London, um, mm -hmm. you know, that I can also be talking to my, you know, people I know across the world, um, really literally um, experiencing very similar things. Right. We're all in lockdown. Um, we're all abiding by, you know, our government's directives to stay right. safe and stay at home. Right. Um, and we're all asking ourselves these very deep and profound questions, right. not only about how am I going to be a different person if, if and when we come through this virus, right. but how is the world in which we live is going to be different wow. and in our, you know, and the world from different perspectives, yeah, right. and from different sectors. Right. Right. So what am I going to be? It's right. a very, very... Um, it's, it's a good question of, you know, so coming through as a storyteller um, to working across the African continent um, wow. in sort of entrepreneurship development. Wow. I think I'd like to think that post-COVID um, that I will continue to do the same work with the same level of passion and commitment. Right. The stories of people who survived COVID will become even more, more important and significant. Right. The stories of people who are going to make um, a contribution in rebuilding um, the devastated economies, the devastated infrastructure are going to become even more important, I guess. Wow. Um, and similarly, the role of entrepreneurs and 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 enterprises or uh, is going to be absolutely fundamental it's going to be core to the revival of, of economies the world yeah. over sure wow wow that's great that's great and uh, we so today we like i mentioned the aim is to uh, celebrate you to thank you for giving back to society and thank you for helping make a change in some young people's lives. And uh, so we'll talk about like uh, the role of young people in this era of COVID-19. But uh, let's move a little back to when uh, you step into the shoes of uh, the Tony Elimelu Foundation. And mm -hmm. I, I quite heard a story about how it started, like you, you started to receive like close to 5,000 uh, applications then when you are stepping out you receive close to 250,000 applications so how has the journey been like the journey was extraordinary I never thought that Africa was in my destiny 
Um, but uh, uh, now that I reflect back on it, it's almost that everything that I had done leading up to um, arriving in Lagos, Nigeria in April 2014 was right. preparing me for that. So I guess I brought a lot of my, you know, a, a suitcase full of skills and experiences in the film and, and television um, industry, in the media and creative industries um, from my work in the UK. Wow. I guess I brought all of that and, and applied it to building, I guess, operationalizing the vision that Mr. Lumalu had of empowering wow. African entrepreneurs across the continent. Great, great, great. And uh, that's quite a milestone because it has helped a lot of people across the length and breadth of Africa to, to really ignite their, uh, their dreams and I quite, uh, can quite remember there were some people who before they applied, their business ideas were not that shaped. They didn't even know what they were doing. But uh, once they got into the competition, they refined their business idea. So maybe if you can touch on some of the yeah, like, highlights. Talk about, you know, talk about the program. What was, <clears throat> I guess, what was my thinking behind the program? Yeah. I think number one, I felt I knew that um, entrepreneurship is teachable and learnable. Really? There are some foundational skills that you as an entrepreneur need um, that you can, um, there's, yeah, there are some foundational skills that you can acquire, really? um, which will help you to define your product or service. You, so you can right. move from an idea to actually launching your business. Great. So it was about structuring a program that would enable um, the entrepreneurs to acquire those skills. And that Great. was the 12 week training program, um, which is really at the heart of what I designed, I guess, in, in 2014. The wow. second is that every entrepreneur needs a mentor, wow. a guide, a coach, a mentor. And we built an amazing database of mentors from around the world so Great. that the entrepreneurs who got selected onto the program from the 20,000 applications in the first year, they would assign a mentor. And I guess the third critical element of the program was the seed capital. Wow. You always need that first $5,000, which you would normally go to your family, fools and friends and say, I have this amazing business idea. I've done some market testing. I think there's a customer for it will you loan me $5,000 so I can, you know, to see, to do a proof of concept of it. Wow. And the $5,000 was literally a seed to these, the entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurs that we selected with our program, the program was sector agnostic. The program was set out to ensure that we reached women business owners. The program was always Pan-African from day one. And you know, that it was, it was open to applicants from across the 54 African countries, the right. North, South, East, West, Central Africa um, right. to apply. Right. And also the program was in three languages. So the content, the 12 week training program was offered in French, Portuguese and English. That was the launch of it. Um, and I, you know, the important thing was to see the entrepreneurs take that you know, the, 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 the structured approach to entrepreneurship development right. and make it their own. I would say that those who really applied themselves to going through the 10, the 12 modules and coming up with a roadmap at the end of those 12 weeks, um, really embodying and owning the tools um, in that um, enterprise toolkit I would say they're the entrepreneurs that would still be surviving in, would survive pre-COVID, during COVID and post-COVID. Right. I think the reality is there were a lot of other entrepreneurs who just thought, oh, you know what? This is you know, easy money, $5,000. Let me apply and mm -hmm. take my chance in, in, in getting it. I never forget a story that Joel Cherip, who's an extraordinary young um, entrepreneur, a farmer in Uganda shared with me um, when he had got selected and he'd received his $5,000. He said to me, ma'am, a lot of people said to me, you know what, you don't have a house. Why don't you build yourself a house? 
you don't have a car, why don't you buy a car? Wow. And he resisted all of those. He continued to live in his tiny, tiny um, home, continued to cycle to his farm, and instead took that money and got himself some more skills, particularly around how to bring irrigation, underground irrigation technology to his farm and use the money to go and find those, that knowledge in, I think he went, came to Europe, bought it back to Uganda, and is now, you know, I mean, now has, you know, a huge, not only a huge farm that produces, um, um, grows crops, every, you know, two or three crops a year, but wow. also then decided that he wanted to teach other young farmers in his area to go from being a small farmer to being a business farmer. Great. So I think those entrepreneurs who really are serious about being entrepreneurs, because entrepreneurship is not easy, yeah. you know? And I think, fine, you know, of the thousand entrepreneurs that we selected every year, a certain percentage of them would have really be high flyers, um, would have grown their businesses, I mean, literally grown them. Others would have maintained uh, what I would have called livelihood entrepreneurs, right? You know, right. the poultry farmer, the fish farmer, um, who are, you know, producing the cassava farmer, the plantain farmer, or, you know, and, and in other, other sectors as well. I think they would have, they are just, you know, breaking even, yeah? Right. And then there are those who tried, but because the, the market changed and that happened a lot in South Africa. There was a real slump in the retail sector. And a lot of entrepreneurs who had retail businesses had to pivot and say, you know what, I have to put my business on a pause, oh. go and get a job or go and do something else. And then I'll come back to, to my business again. Yeah. But I think the most important thing from that five years was I, you know, was literally institutionalizing luck and democratizing opportunity. Wow. Um, but, you know, but it also, when you do something like that and you raise the expectations from 20,000, as you mentioned, in 2015 to 200,000 in, you know, over 200,000 in 2019, and I'm assuming in 2020, it would have been even more. Um, you know, you're also raising expectations and you then begin to say, you know what, actually to really grow support African entrepreneurs, they need ongoing support. They need ongoing resources. And, and you know, and I think that's the big challenge, um, you know, in terms of coming through COVID, um, those that do survive the, the you know, the, this virus pandemic, you know, how do we begin to differentiate between what I call livelihood entrepreneurs? Um, you know, literally, it's about their livelihood. They're, you know, they are, they've set up small businesses in order to put food on the table to those who are really dynamic and high growth entrepreneurs who are going to create jobs, who are really going to, I don't know, do big innovation. But really? we can speak about that. Wow, wow. So that's wonderful. And uh, you, you've been a mentor during the program. If uh, your passion is to help young people, like when you see young people doing great things, you are passionate about that. And uh, I could quite remember when I, I met you in South Africa, and it's just a question I asked about uh, technology and entrepreneurship. And uh, someone after the event, breakout session someone told me that uh, you were asking about uh, the person who asked the question and to me oh. it, uh, it touched my heart to let uh, me appreciate that there are people who actually love africa and they care about africa and young people and they just want to give like opportunity to people to grow and to me that is a, a plus for you thank you for that and, uh, but the question also has to do with, you are not part of, you, you've resigned, you've stepped down as a, a, a CEO, but you still coach people, you still mentor people. So can you t tell us why you still do that, why you're still passionate about that? I think, you know, once you've got, you know, so, 
It's very interesting. I don't think I can ever stop doing that because just as, you know, so what is it that I have now? I have knowledge, I have experience, I have hindsight. Right. Um, I make many mistakes in my life. So what can I do when I meet young people who are struggling <clears throat> with challenges, who can see opportunities um, and want to develop a roadmap to be able to access those opportunities? I think what, you know, it's such a, it's such a pleasure, it's such a privilege to be able to share that experience yeah. and share that journey so that you don't make the same mistakes, but you will inevitably make new mistakes. I'm a mother of two young daughters, and it's been very important to me to model good behavior, to right. model leadership, to model independence, to model self-direction. And I think for me, um, Africa has everything that it needs. It wow. has everything. Wow. It, the, you know, and its biggest, it has everything from natural resources wow. um, to the most extraordinary, you know, 60% of the land, arable land in the world is in Africa. Wow. Um, so it has everything it needs on the continent. Great. And its biggest asset for me when I arrived in Africa and I saw for myself as I traveled across the many countries is this young people is wow. its human capital, is people like yourself who are not waiting for a handout, but a hand up. You're not asking for help. What wow. you're asking for is investment. Wow. Investment in you, not just, it's not just in terms of capital investment, mm -hmm. but investment in you in terms of your development of your skills, right. um, for you to be able to realize your abilities, yeah? Um, investment in you through all the different, you know, systems, the education, the health system, the infrastructure. It's about enabling you and creating an enabling environment where young Africans on the continent, there's no young African on the continent that I came across who wants to leave the continent, right? Mm -hmm. If the conditions under which they, if, you know, if the conditions um, were made right, were, you know, were conducive for them to be able to realize their full potential. I mean, you know, why does a, someone with a civil engineering degree, a medical degree, end up sweeping streets in, in, in Paris or London, right? Wow. I mean, you've seen how in the frontline workers in, in the UK, in the, in the National Health Service, yeah. I know for a fact, come from Africa. Yeah. Wow. So if we can, if the African young people can come and work in the UK, why is, why don't we also create the living and the working environment across the continent so that we can keep that talent and let it work for the development, the economic, social, cultural, political development of Africa? Wow. Wow. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Like I'm always touched when I hear you speak. And uh, you, you seem to be more Pan-African than myself <laughs> because of your, like, yes, you, you, you love Africa. Africa is in you. And I think uh, after this, I'll just tell Samia Nkrumah, the daughter of uh, Kwame Nkrumah, like, about how passionate you are. Wow. About Africa, yes, yes. So I think I will also link you up so that... Uh, Please do. Wow. Please do, my Great. hero. Great, great, great. Absolutely. Great. And uh, so the other uh, experience I would like to hear from you is uh, you've touched, you've helped a lot of young people. You've seen those who are passionate. You've seen uh, people, young people who come to the uh, Tony Lemilu program and uh, they are passionate about what they want to do. But at the end of the day, they make one or two mistakes. And uh, I think their businesses some of some some of them they lose their businesses or things happen so maybe some of the challenges you face with young people during the tournament foundation so that people who are listening and they want to start something they don't get into those mistakes so i think it's not so much mistakes you know entrepreneurship you know i arrived in 2014 entrepreneurship was just beginning to emerge it was beginning to be seen that it was okay, it was cool and sexy to be an entrepreneur. 
Right. Um, it took decades for India to embrace entrepreneurship. If you came home and told your parents you were going to be, you wanted to be an entrepreneur, they looked at you and said, are you mad? We've just <laughs> invested so much money in giving you this amazing education and you want to blow it away by spending time trying to set up a business. So the, right. you know, that it wasn't, you know, entrepreneurship and the, being an entrepreneur in India was not, you know, what isn't what it is today, which is, you know, it, there's a celebrity status to being an entrepreneur. Right. Um, because I think, you know, that it was like, this is so, you know, it's such a, it's such a risky space. At yeah. least when you're in a corporate job, you know, there's a job and you know, you're going to get the nine to five salary. And, 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 and yes, you can have a little enterprise on the side, but don't say that you're going to make being an entrepreneur your um, central being. And I think what Africa over the last decade, certainly, you know, the, you know from 2010, um, when, Af you know, the economist said Africa is rising. And how is Africa rising? It's rising because of its private sector. Yeah. You know, the governments have been in power and in control for decades before that. But right. the reason why Africa was rising is because the private sector across the continent was being unleashed. Yeah. Um, countries like, I don't know, Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, were actually um, showing, um, you know, annual growth in terms of their economies. Right. And it was, you know, so, you know, the, so the role of the private sector was now beginning to be seen to be important in the, the development and the growth of the, of, of Africa in terms of the economies of Africa, yeah, right. the Africa as an economic, um, um, you know, continent rather than, right. you know, a continent that always um, came into the news for all the social challenges and social problems. Right. So I would say that you know that you know everybody was learning. Suddenly, the 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 African entrepreneurs, you know. Are we life, livelihood entrepreneurs? Are we dynamic entrepreneurs? Do we want to be high growth entrepreneurs like Mandela? Do we want to be tech entrepreneurs like Bongo Hive in, in, in Zambia? Um, do we want to be health entrepreneurs like this extraordinary young woman, LifeBank, the founder of LifeBank in Nigeria, which won the Africa Business Heroes Prize from the Jack Ma Foundation? I mean, they were beginning to look, explore the different ways of being entrepreneurs. Right. And similarly, the governments were also beginning to say, oh my gosh, we have a big, we have a big challenge, but it's actually an opportunity, which is we have, you know, the world's youngest population. Right. How do we harness that talent and how do we begin to make it work for the development of Africa, right? right. And in terms of self-reliance. Um, we don't have to outsource everything outside of our countries. Yeah. Um, what about also beginning to look at intra-Africa trade? Yeah? yeah. What about also beginning to look at ways in which, you know, something that's grown in Nigeria could find a market in, in not just yeah. in Ghana, its next door neighbor, but in North, in, you know, in Eastern Africa, et cetera. So there was a lot of activity, a lot of hope, um, and there still is in terms of, um, you know, what African SMEs and what African entrepreneurs could do in and across the African continent. Okay. And I think it was the convergence of the importance of the private sector and the recognition by the government for investing in the private sector and, 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 and equally importantly, investing in building an enabling environment where African SMEs, African entrepreneurs could begin to thrive. Right. You know, so of course there's going to be a lot of mistakes. It's not like, you know, a structured way of, of um, supporting African entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship ecosystem had been there for decades. No. Um, and some entrepreneurs, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, didn't take it seriously. Yeah. Some entrepreneurs found it really tough going. You know, it's one thing to get up in the morning and say, I have a business idea, but to go to bed at night saying, you know, discovering that actually your business idea is, has huge competitors already outside. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, but 
you know, I think what not just the Tony Illumini Foundation, but all the other um, ecosystem support organizations, the entrepreneurship support organizations around the continent, we were beginning to design or create um, design programs that would really act as guides, you know, yeah. guide the entrepreneur through some of those pitfalls, yeah, right. and support them. Um, I think one of the, the biggest thing, you know, was also beginning to see how we can build networks of entrepreneurs across the continent sure. in their countries and also enable them to begin to connect with each other across the countries. Wow. One of the most magical moments for me was to watch African entrepreneurs come from the 54 African countries and meet each other for the first time because wow. a you know, we did use technology, we did, you know, and all, a lot of the, the programs around the continent um, use technology as a way of also, you know, in terms of skills development. But, you know, but there's no, um, you know, there's no replacement for the face-to-face -face contact. I mean, yeah. the fact that you and I met at yes. a networking event, I think it was in South Africa, as you said, um, that, you know, I mean, it's irreplaceable, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, and so I, I would say, I think it's really important that African entrepreneurs continue to make mistakes, continue to learn. You're yeah. only a failure if you don't learn from the things that, yeah. have, that have gone wrong, right? Wow. But if, you're, if you are really serious about being an entrepreneur, if you're really serious about scaling your business idea, um, then you you know you will put your heart and soul into that. Great, great. So that's magical and that's fine. And uh, the other thing has to do with uh, the role of government and uh, entrepreneurship. So because we do see, to me, I've gone to places and uh, like different travel to different countries, and sometimes I feel like uh, this is something that we can do back in Africa in terms of supporting young businesses, in terms of even developing like, if it is tourism or whatever it is for people to come and benefit, but we can do mm. it through young entrepreneurs. So what is the role? What have you seen? Because we've worked with many governments, we've seen how they operate. What do you think is missing or can be done to help young entrepreneurs? I think the irony is that COVID-19 is a wake up call. Yeah. To Opportunity to actually celebrate um, how African government leaders have stepped up to the mark yeah, wow. during this period. Right, yeah. every single every single country across the world was caught unawares. Right, yeah. um, in terms of just how big the size and the scale of this pandemic. And I'm really I have watched the African political leaders really rise to the challenge and right. really, um, you know, put in place um, systems and structures to safeguard their populations. I've also seen the same in the African development um, agencies like the Africa Development Bank, like Afriexium, um, and like, you know, Afriexium Bank, um, and many of the other African um, development agencies have also, again, risen to the challenge in terms of addressing not just the health crisis but right. also beginning to think of the economic um, fallout from this crisis i think the same for the international development agencies mm -hmm. so the role if we if before particularly looking at it from the african entrepreneurs perspective and sme perspective you know before covid we did not engage seriously with the government because yeah. we thought the government was an impediment, it was an obstacle, right? And that the, you know, the, the, the things that the government should have been doing, building infrastructure, you know, looking at regulation and looking at policy, it just wasn't doing it to work in the interest of African SME. It was right. beginning to embrace that. But now, post -COVID, during COVID and post COVID, the African government, have no choice but to address those challenges. Yeah. 
but we, but the African entrepreneurs and African SMEs also have a role to play, right? Yeah. Um, and I think for me, yes, I can, we can talk about what the government must do. It must do all the things that it should have been doing in pro pre um, COVID time in terms of policies, regulation, the enabling environment, the taxation, you know, the ease of doing and setting up business, all of those things, yeah? Mm -hmm. But I think the role of the SMEs now in, in you know, during COVID and, and post-COVID is going to become fundamentally important. And right. now, you know, as we come through this, it, you know, it's going to become really important that SMEs become active in their governments. Great. You know, the, if we've seen that the, it is the governments that have provided uh, the stimulus packages, right? Yeah. It's really important that, you know, post COVID, that African SMEs and African entrepreneurs' voices are heard directly by the government, not mediated by middlemen and, middle or women, but, you know, middle, middle people, but that there is a direct link between the SMEs and the government, and the government right. is developing policies that that are based on what the African um, entrepreneurs and SMEs are, are telling them. I think the African SMEs have to begin to learn to lobby and yeah. lobby and advocate for, for SMEs, yeah? Right. They have to begin to organize um, themselves, you know, at a national level, as well as at regional levels, as well as at pan-African level, and make their voices, their collective responses to those policies and their collective demands make those voices heard um, in government. So I would like to see that what will emerge post-COVID is a greater alignment, a greater connectivity between the African SMEs and entrepreneurs and government. Wow, that's great, that's great. And, uh... And I think that is the role that we have to take. And uh, if you are at home and you are a young entrepreneur, you don't wait for government. You just start doing something. And uh, we advocate and we lobby, make sure that we get our voices heard. That's powerful. Then, uh, now let's get back to most people, when they are interviewing you, I watch the interviews. It seems to focus more on the Tony Elimelu but I didn't know that you have a 20 year <laughs> movie production career, which indeed, uh, indeed. To change. <laughs> right. So indeed uh, you've been celebrated. Uh, you've done a lot of work. Uh, quite frankly, when I was looking uh, through your profile and uh, going through some of the movies you've just produced, uh, which is one is the baby mother in 1998. And so can you tell us about uh, how like you, you fed into it and uh, what were some of the opportunities and looking at how we have content in Africa. And I love some of the, the like even the captions of the movies, you know, that or the documentaries that you produce show that we should celebrate you more. So. Oh, thank you, Abraham. Right. You know, I always forget that I spent, yeah, 20 plus years as a filmmaker yeah. traveling. And that, in fact, that's what brought me to Africa in the first place. I made wow. film in Burkina Faso, in wow. Angola, in Mozambique, in South Africa, in Nigeria. So, you know, film, film is my passion. That was, you know, storytelling was Great. my passion. Why? How did I fall into filmmaking? You know, I'm, I'm, as you know, that I was born in India, came to, from, to England at the age of 10. So I grew up in Britain and yeah. I grew up watching British television and British cinema. Right. And yes, you know, while my parents, you know, would take me and show me, um, you know, we would, we would still continue um, to watch, you know, Bollywood movies um, as a child growing up. But it was always on a sort of Sunday, and it was only these three hours when the community could rent a cinema. Um, but you know, so all of the rest of my time, I would watch television, and it would be all, you know, it would be British television, it would be maybe programs from America. But you know, there was no reflection of who I was on those screens, whether it was 
in film or in, in television. Right. Um, and it was always, it was the desire to tell stories, you know, in the same wow. way. It was, it was wow. this deep desire to support the empowerment of African entrepreneurs. So mine, for me, my attraction to film and, and working in the film and television industry was never that there is, is glamour, but it's mm. the power of storytelling wow. and the power of that story to be able to reach and touch lives, you know, so you could make a film in, 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 in Ghana, or you could make a film in Lagos, but if the story, but you know, the power of that story to be able to touch people living in somewhere in, in, in the UK or even the US. So for me, it was the power of storytelling. That was the first reason. And I guess the second was really that television and film industry in the UK on screen and behind the screen could not go on being the way it was, that it, it, it had to change, that it had to begin to reflect the multicultural nature of Britain that I was growing up in. Mm -hmm. I, was, I grew up in, in, in a tiny town in Southampton, but most of my life I've lived and worked in London. And you know, I, you know, I have grown up with people from Africa, from the Caribbean, from China, from India, from Pakistan, Bangladesh, from Eastern Europe, you know, so it really is a multicultural society. And I used to say that if a Martian landed in London and walked around the streets of London, they would see one kind of Britain. And then when, if he, the Martian went home and turned on their TV, they would see an ethnically cleansed television, i.e. Right. that they wouldn't be um, actors from, and you know, from who looked like who came from, um, from the what was you know the the black and ethnic minority communities. Right. So my motivation for entering the industry was that to begin to to be able to tell stories that were not being being told. Wow. And I I think it, the timing of that was right that you know we had television that was willing to take chances on first time filmmakers. I'd never been to film school, um, but. It was the story that I pitched that, that they were attracted to. And you only need to make your first film. It's like you only need to start your first business in order to make all the mistakes and learn from it. Yeah. And that's exactly what I did. I was able to raise money for my first film. I was 30 years old. Um, and then I watched. I employed professionals. And I didn't pay myself on the first film. Wow. But I used it, for me, it was going to be my, I was going to use it to learn all aspects of the film. Right. From, the, from the development of the idea, to raising the money, to putting the production team together, to then, um, you know, for the film was, the, the, the program, the half hour film um, was broadcast on Channel 4. And that was in 19, I think it was in 1986, 87. Ten years later, I made, you know, I then, there was no stopping me, you know, wow. in terms of developing, you know, it's like a serial, filmmaking is like being a serial entrepreneur because every film is like setting up a new business because yes. each film is very unique and very different. So, you know, so I would finish one film and I would start another and I'd wow. raise the money and go through the same processes right. while also you know, maintaining a home and being a mother. But it was exhilarating. It was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And I know that by, I remember by 2000, by sort of 1995, um, I also, you know, I continued making films, but also then began to also lead a campaign around a greater representation of Black and ethnic minority talent, both on screen and behind screen. So for me, filmmaking was really literally the passion is it was about and remains storytelling. So when I arrived in the Tony Illuminati Foundation, I thought, oh, fantastic. I won't be making films because I don't want to be, a, a, you know, I'm now no longer a frontline producer. But I saw the opportunity to tell stories. I thought, my goodness, if I don't document, you know, how, you know, we started the, 
just this particular accelerator program, the Tony Lee Foundation Entrepreneurship Program, 10 years later, somebody else will come and try and tell that story without having been there at the beginning of it. And you've seen, you know, the, I've made three films for the foundation wow. and they're on their wow. website, three documentaries, um, 2015, 2016, and 2018. Wow. In fact, the president of Ghana was in the audience when I screened the last film, which was interviews with the entrepreneurs. And if I, you know, so there's a part of me now that I was, you know, that I would love to, you know, find ways of continuing to, to tell those stories, um, to continue to support African, um, Africans to tell their own stories. Oh, wow. And, you know, and of course, you know, I, I consumed African cinema, you know, coming out from Ghana, coming out from Nigeria. I mean, um, you know, Ghana was Love Brood in the African Pop as a Ghanaian film. Um, I remember, you know, I mean, I remember when I programmed a festival called um, Fest uh, Third Eye, London's Festival of Third World Cinema. We, we did a huge focus on the, the development of African cinema in Burkina Faso was another one. Mozambique had a film institute. Um, South Africa obviously had, has a film culture. And that's what brought me to Africa was making films with African directors and African writers and African producers. Wow. Oh, that's wonderful. And uh, because I can see that you tell the African story like the African way. So you've gotten the perspective to, as a storyteller, you've listened to the stories of Africa and uh, in Africa, you've listened to the stories of Africa, outside Africa. So what is the difference? Because Very we, yeah. I think, you know, I mean, there are, you know, if, if you were before COVID, yeah. You know, if you were in London, you could be, you be, if you were going to the theater, you'd be going to see a lot of plays written by Ghanaians and written by Nigerian writers. Wow. You'd see stages full of African actors, yeah? Mm -hmm. If you pick up the fashion magazines, you would see African talent across wow. that in the UK, yeah? If you listen to music, Stormzy, you know, he's, he is of African descent. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there is an African in him. Right. Um, there are many, many. So I was, you know, so I was looking at, my goodness, this is amazing that the African talent in the UK um, has a place and a space and a voice. And it is being, you know, and it can access the funding and resources that are available to the wider, you know, cultural, arts, film, media community. I think across the African continent, um, there is no shortage of stories. You just have to wake up and walk out of your door. You are hit with constantly with stories. I think what we need across the African continent, and Nigeria does provide a model that can work and is working certainly for Nigeria, is a structured approach to content production and, right. and, and the distribution of it. There is no reason why, um, I mean, you know, we did have Oroko as a platform, the digital platform that was founded by a Nigerian entrepreneur to make available African content, beginning with Nollywood content, yeah? Right. I think the difference is um, that the African content in Africa um, ha, is really serves a, a, a fantastic local audience. Right. You know, so in Hollywood, there are over 600 million of people across the African continent who consume Nollywood. Yeah? yeah, you and I may be critical of his quality, but you know, it has a consumer. Um, I think there are a lot of films that are made in Kenya, in Uganda, by their local film industries that are consumed by the local um, local audiences. I think we need to do, there needs to be more of those storytellings, yeah? Right. Um, 
I think also in the new streaming platforms like Netflix, Apple, or Amazon, or, you know, they need to come to Africa. Yes. They need to prioritize coming to Africa, employing African talent as writers, directors, technicians, actors, musicians, um, to tell authentically African stories, oh, yes. wow. which I know if they are done well, will find a universal audience. Great, 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 great. And uh, you always say that uh, Africa matters. And this is the time for Africa. And uh, what is it? What is, do we have as young Africans uh, that you know that this is the time for Africa? I watched your previous interview. You made mention that with all the like opportunities that we Africa missed, and uh, we have all what we have, but during the COVID, uh, in the uh, midst of this COVID crisis, this is the time for African leaders, the time for African entrepreneurs to actually take charge and take over whatever they want to do. So maybe if you have something there. Yeah. I think I totally agree with all that, you know, all that you have said. That's why it matters. Yeah. Africa's biggest asset is its human capital. Mm. And that asset is a young demographic. And mm. those young people are ambitious. You know, they are aspirational. They are highly educated. They are highly motivated. Yeah. Right. There is nothing, nothing that a young African man or a woman cannot do right. um, that, you know, that we, and cannot produce if they are given, the, you know, the right support and the right resources. Right. I think coming out of this COVID, you know, self-reliance is, is going to move center stage across right. the continent. There right. is now, you know, African, across the African continent, the governments have to begin to bring back the supply chains across the different sectors, and whether it's the creative, the health sector, the education, the manufacturing, you know, I mean, all of those ICT, you know, all of those sectors, they need to bring back those supply chains and begin right. to build the manufacturing hubs across the continent. Right. There is no reason why Africans, when they have so many cows across the continent are actually importing secondhand shoes. Wow. There is no reason why Africans, um, when they have, um, you know, the engineering skills, they wow. are bringing secondhand cars that wow. are clogging up the streets across, the, you know, across countries, you know, in, in my, Uganda is, is an example of that, yeah? You know, I mean, there's no reason why motorbikes, um, you know, there's no reason why anything and everything that, that, that a country needs, that a continent needs, is being imported into the country, yeah? Wow. Africa has what it takes. Wow. And, and, what is, and what is that? It's human capital. Human capital. And it's, it's not a human ca capital that is, I never saw or came across an African begging for to be helped. Wow. I came across people saying, you know, it's, I, I came across many frustrated people because mm -hmm. the obstacles that are being thrown in their ways, I came across people saying, remove the obstacles, enable, facilitate, support. It's really? not that they need help. They need enablement, they need support, and they need facilitating. Um, and Africa matters because if the African continent, as I have now seen it and experienced it and felt it, is not allowed to, does not realize its full potential, those young people, that very extraordinary talent, can also turn in on itself. Yeah? Right. And there's no country across the African continent that can afford for that to happen. And now is the time for the African governments to be bold in the decisions that they make right. and to really push through the self-reliant agenda, to really look at the opportunities from the coronavirus. Health care and health sector is 
is a huge opportunity for the African continent. Young people are the ones who are going to make that happen. Yeah? Right. Digital transformation. Now, let's not just talk about digital transformation. Do it. Because uh -huh. this coronavirus has shown why Africa needs, to, needs that transformation, needs that revolution. But never mind that it needs it. It has the capacity to achieve it. Because wow. young Africa was born with that technology in their hand. They know. And they know that they can leapfrog it, and they will. They are leapfrogging it. The role of the government is to begin to invest in that infrastructure, and Great. employ young ICT whiz kids to make that happen. Yeah? And I would say that the fine, the other is really agriculture. Great. One of the things that always struck me with when I was reading the applications, over the thousands of applications that we received in in the foundation was how young Africans, like yourself, saw agriculture yeah. as cool and sexy. You know, it wasn't like that you had to be dragged into seeing agriculture as a business opportunity. Uh -huh. But these young Africans were applying for business ideas based around the agri um, food, uh, value chain. And uh -huh. I think here is an opportunity, and it is, for, yes, we clap. I've been clapping our National Health Service and the frontline workers in the UK. But in Africa, it is the farmers that we need to be clapping, right? The yeah. farmers have kept us fed. They have kept yeah. growing the food. They've got the food out of the farm into, into the cities and onto our tables, yeah? Wow. So I think agriculture and, and the development of ag both smallholding farmers and the commercial farmers is a big, big opportunity for African governments, African leaders, African policymakers, African entrepreneurs, African SMEs to, mm -hmm. to really begin to, to leverage um, post-COVID. Great. Wow, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you for this. And uh, I think it will inspire a lot of young people to take opportunities, i.e. in the technology sector, agriculture sector, and all the sectors. So uh, maybe your final words to the young people, those who started their businesses, those who are going through mentorship under your watch, if you have something to tell any of them, <laughs> right? So I think, you know, as entrepreneurs, African entrepreneurs, um, yes, COVID and, and the lockdown and, and everything that's gone come with it is horrendous. But, you know, but the, one of the things that I really experienced and felt across the continent as I traveled talking to young, African, young Africans is their resilience. You are, you are extraordinarily resilient. You are extraordinarily creative. You. And you don't, you have the can do. And I would say that you have to, you have to hold that and let that be your light and let that be your guide. Wow. Yes. But at the same time, you also have to begin to really now organize yourself and organize right. collectively um, right. so that it's not a lone voice. You're no right. longer, I'm the lone entrepreneur, but a collective voice that comes together and actually begins to talk and engage with government leaders. Right. We, you know, going forward, um, African SMEs, African entrepreneurs, you can no longer see the government as your enemy Great. or as, Great. you know, as the doors that need to be bashed down. Great. You have to go there and begin to build those relationships. Yeah. And the same, so, you know, across any, all the kind of, you know, funding, financing, investment, business development, support service structures, you have to make it so that you are not just the recipients of it, but you are the co-creators of, of that uh, and building those infrastructures. I think it's really important to continue to think out of the box. I think it's really important to begin to develop your digital skills right. and, and think about no longer, I'm just an offline business or I'm a digital business. It's a combination and the, and the strength of, of, of both of right. those. But at most, you know, really it's is collaboration and partnership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now is the time to begin those um, the you know those networks 
and begin to learn and engage with each other in terms of sharing best practice and building peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, we just spoke to uh, our only mother, auntie, sister. Uh, she is a film producer with over 20 years of experience. You don't know what this means. And she's also the former CEO of uh, the Tony Elimelu Foundation. She's the pioneer CEO. And uh, we've seen that the change that she's created. Thank you for making us all proud of whatever we do, helping us and coaching and mentoring us. You, I believe in you. Thank you for the opportunity. Right, thank Abraham, you. Stay good, stay thank safe. You. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.